The real world is three-dimensional, and so we need to have a method that allows us to write down all of our equations of motion for a more complicated three-dimensional motion, and that method uses vectors. As before, you may want to pause this uh, video in order to be able to look at one of the screens at greater length than I'll give you when we're going through it. We've already gone through the basics of vectors in the first part of Chapter 3, that we write our vectors in a Cartesian coordinate system, which are x, y, and z axes that are perpendicular to one another, and those directions are defined by i, j, k unit vectors. Occasionally, you'll see people use x, y, z hat unit vectors to represent the same information. Uh, the basic idea is that you can write one symbol, the, like r vector, or delta r vector, or v vector, or a vector, and that that one simple symbol represents a large amount of information, the individual components that make up that particular vector, the x, y, and z components, as you see here. Uh, we do a few problems with three-dimensional motion, but most of the time we'll look only at x and y components because that's enough to get across the main ideas of what we want to be able to do. The same equations can be written in a more compact notation that's introduced in Calc 3 in the textbooks we use here at TCC. If you know how to use this, it's okay. If you don't know how to use it, don't. This is really the only people who should use this are ones who are experienced using it from having taken Calc 3. If you write a mixture of the two notations, that answer will be marked wrong on exams. Okay, so the basic thing is we're, ba we're repeating everything we did in Chapter 2 one more time. Notice there's only two equations introduced in this part of Chapter 3. Equation 3.8, which is like 2.7, and 3.9, which is like 2.10. It's for this reason that I put those two equations, 2, 7 and 2, 10, at the top of your list, because those two are used the most in what we do the rest of this course. There's also equations like our third and fourth equations, but those tend to be less important, and they're unimportant enough that our textbook's author doesn't bother wasting any ink on those equations. They work pretty much the way they once work in Chapter 2, but I want to show you that in this presentation. And, of course, you should know the definitions. What you should notice is that there's a fairly compact representation that when you write something like v average equals delta r vector over delta t, you're writing down three equations, one for x, one for y, and one for z. So, for example, our first equation, v equals v naught plus at. In vectors, all of the vector variables, the velocity and the acceleration, have an arrow over them. The scalar variable time does not. And that first vector equation is just shorthand for two separate equations, one for the x component of the velocity in terms of its initial value and its acceleration, and one for the y component of the velocity in terms of its initial value and the y component of the acceleration. Each of these is separately, just like equation 2, 7, and they're used exactly the same way. So in principle, you already know these equations. Same thing's true for the second one. Position is initial position plus initial velocity times time plus one-half the acceleration times time squared. As a vector equation, that's actually two equations, one for the x motion, one for the y motion. And the really interesting and cool thing is that as long as we've got the kinds of conditions met in our problems with fairly simple constant accelerations, those equations are decouple from one another. So there's nothing in the x equation that involves y and nothing in the y equation that involves x. This is a critical thing that makes solving problems fairly straightforward for what we're going to do in this class, but not easy because you have to learn how to work with more than one equation, sometimes as many as four equations in the same problem. When we do free fall, that means the acceleration is due entirely to gravity, no drag forces of any kind, in which case the acceleration is purely in the y direction. The x component is 0, the y component is negative g, or negative 9.80 meters per second squared. Now there are two other equations, as I said, the third and fourth ones that I had you learn for everything we do in chapter 2. Remember one of them was found by eliminating time, and the other actually just started from a definition. It's the third one that's tricky here, and I want to say a few words about it. In fact, that's the real reason for this video. That third equation applies to each component separately. So for the x components of the velocity and the x component of the acceleration and the x delta x, 
you've got the same equation we had for motion in the x direction. And if you had a pure one-dimensional motion in the y direction, same thing. But only the y components are in that equation. Now it turns out you can combine those two equations into one, but when you do that, you get a vector equation that involves the magnitude of the vector squared and the dot product, as it's called, the little dot there between the a vector and the delta r vector, uh, a dot product of two things. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't use this equation. I'm sure that's the reason why our author left this equation out of the book. The top two equations are all you need. They're valid because they apply to, they can be derived from a particular component by taking the first and second equations and eliminating t. They're very powerful. They're often used, but you've got to be careful and use only the x's or only the y's. Never mix and match. The fourth one is just the definition written as vectors. Delta x equals v average delta t. And for constant acceleration, v average is the arithmetic average of v1 and v2. Same thing as we've seen before. OK, so that's the basics here. Everything else is applications of these equations. Remember, these vectors are just shorthand for familiar one-dimensional equations. And so you can use them much the same way. But they're generally different in this case because they're connected by the parameter of time so that we'll often be using the x equation to find a time and then using that time to find a y value or vice versa. Finally, if you have not seen vectors recently and you don't really remember how they work, you want to spend a lot of time on, on the first parts of this chapter, especially section 3.1, and work some of the extra practice problems that you've been given that enable you to practice and learn how to find magnitudes and components of vectors.